Welcome to today's webinar on how to audit the top 10 e-business suite security risk. My name is Phil Ryman. I'll be the moderator for this session. Our speakers today are Jeffrey Hare and Steve Cox. Now, Jeffrey is the founder of ERP Advisors, and he's written uh, many, many papers and books, including papers for the uh, white papers for the uh, OAE, OAUG. I can't say it. And he's in the past experience is working for 14 years with uh, on the Oracle e EBS, both as a consultant and as a, uh, a client. His background includes Big Four and six years uh, being a CFO and an auditor with the various duties that that includes. He's also authored uh, one of the better, better books out there on security, which is the Oracle Business Suite Controls Application Security Best Practices. Uh, join Steve, joining uh, Jeff today is Steve Coast. He's the CTO and founder of Integrity Corporation. And like Jeffrey, he got his basic training working, working with the big four audit firms. In the last 12 years, he spent focused on uh, Oracle security. And he's held duties and responsibilities, including the DBA and technical architect and the uh, CT security architect. Integrity Corporation, which Steve is the founder of, uh, does security, consulting both in security assessments and services, and they also have a couple of products, one of which is AppSentry, which we'll be referencing today. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jeff. Uh, thanks, Phil, and I'd like to add my welcome to everybody uh, to today's webinar as well. And we have a full packed hour, so we're going to get right to the agenda. And we've got a great, uh, great group of people responding. We, we're one of the best uh, webinar attendants that we've had. So our agenda for the day um, is going to be looking at these type of items, risks, threats, and vulnerabilities, passwords, internal and external access, control policies and procedures, and then we're going to leave as much time as we can for Q&A. So the, what we're attempting to address here is the top 10 security vulnerabilities for companies running the Oracle eBusiness suite. Um, we could spend probably days on this topic if we would. Certainly it would take a couple of days to go through this in a, in a training session with both Steve and I as instructors. So we're going to hit the uh, the 10,000 foot view or in some cases the 50,000 foot view on some of these topics. Um, but hopefully give you enough information to understand some of the vulnerabilities and risks, and ways to address those. And obviously Steve and I will be available for questions and, and uh, an opportunity to interact with you on, on, uh, outside of this webinar. So with that in mind, um, we're going to talk through uh, the top 10. One comment I would have um, as we discuss these top ten is it's difficult to say which one which one or ones are the most significant. A lot of it comes down to which which applications you deploy, what controls you have in place, um, and so on. So we've uh, we've somewhat prioritized these, but um, in a given environment, uh, nine could be one and one could be nine or ten or something like that. So. Keep that in mind as we go throughout the presentation, and if you certainly have specific questions when we get to the Q&A session, um, let us know. So uh, not necessarily order, but in order from uh, order of risk, but order from 1 to 10, we're going to go through these. The first one, uh, default database passwords. Uh, second one, default application passwords. Uh, number three, direct database access. Uh, number four, poor application security design. Number five, external application access configuration, so uh, internet-facing applications. Um, six, poor patching policies and procedures. Um, we can extend that to other policies and procedures that are poor related to change management as well, but we're going to focus on patching today. Um, access to SQL forms in the application, number seven. Uh, number eight, weak change control procedures. Number nine, uh, no database or application auditing. Um, Steve and I did our first webinar together a couple of years ago on, um, on building an effective audit trail. It's going to be, if, if you're interested, that's, I think we still have a recorded version of that somewhere. And then number 10, um, weak application password controls. So we're going to go into some of these uh, in much more detail in the slides to come. Like I said, we're going to hit some topics uh, in a little more detail than others, but we will at least touch on um, in each one of these uh, throughout the rest of the webinar. So significant security risks and threats. I'm going to introduce Steve here and let him cover uh, this, uh, this slide. Thanks, Jeff. So what we've done here is taken the security vulnerabilities on the previous slide and mapped them out to some specific risks and threats that you kind of have in your environment. So for those on the call today who have had actually some sort of formal security training, you're probably familiar with the concept of CIA, not the one in Langley, but confidentiality, 
integrity and availability. So what we did is we looked at those three aspects of security and kind of map them out to the vulnerabilities that we're talking about. So across the top there, one through ten are the different vulnerabilities and issues in your Oracle Business Suite that we're going to talk about and how those actually might impact your environment. What's actually the risk and the threat? So one of the big ones is basically sensitive data loss. And this could be anything from credit card numbers, social security numbers, so if you're running an HR system, you may have social security numbers, uh, home addresses, birth date of birth, full name. That's worth about $50 per person in your environment on the street. So if someone actually gets in and steals 10,000 identities, they can probably sell those for about $50 each. So you can actually put a dollar amount on some of the sensitive data. And there's really two ways to steal it. One is through direct access. So basically I'm logging into the database and we'll talk about that. And then also indirect access. I may have opened up onto the internet. So I may be running iSupply or something. Oh, by the way, when you run iSupplier on the internet with Oracle Business Suite, you're running your HR system on the internet. You may not be able to directly access it, but someone can potentially access the data. Two areas related to integrity of the data, number two and three, are basically related to fraud. So if I can do things in the Oracle Business Suite I'm not supposed to, I can actually circumvent your application controls. So one is actually directly entering a transaction. If I can get into the back-end database, I can just go update bank account numbers potentially. And there's a number of different ways we'll talk about that someone could do that in your organization. Um, number three is basically at the application level. Can I circumvent the application controls? One of those ways is basically that I can access someone else's account without them knowing. I can basically go in and if I can access the AP manager's account and then maybe another AP user's account, I can potentially do the classic, create a vendor, create some purchase orders and actually receive against those and pay some invoices and actually do a classic um, payment fraud. And then finally, availability. Um, when you think about your organization and your Oracle Business Suite, what would happen if someone just wiped out your Oracle Business Suite environment? Well, you might be down for 24 hours. That's really the typical time frame that it would take for the DBAs to realize something seriously is wrong, restore the database, and actually get your organization back up in line. So if you're not shipping out product for 24 or 48 hours, what's the financial impact to your organization? So these are kind of just mapping out the threats to some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So when you're thinking about database passwords, you can now think about, hey, this is actually what somebody can do with them and how it will actually impact my organization at a bottom line number. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we're going to head on to the next slide, so we're going to get into the top ten next. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, default database passwords. So what we're talking about there is a variety of different uh, database passwords that become delivered with the application, things that are core of the application, things that are core to the database. So an example would be a uh, login that's GL where the default password is GL um, that becomes active out of the box and has significant privileges associated with it. So I'm going to talk, let TCT talk about their experience on what they find with some of these default Oracle password statistics. So with Integrity, one of the services we offer is we actually do on-site security assessments for a lot of our clients. So as part of that process, we actually gather a lot of data. So one of the things we want to know is where are the vulnerabilities, where are the issues, what's real life for most organizations. And so what we've done is actually <clears throat> during those assessments, we gather up what passwords we find as default passwords and how important are those. And so this table here shows for some of the key, just the standard, these are in almost every Oracle database in the world. And as you can see, the third column exists in database of a, about 120 production databases. These are mostly Oracle Business Suite, SAP, PeopleSoft, so large ERP installations. And so you can see a lot of these passwords exist 99% of the time. And then the final column is how often we find the default password. So anyone can basically connect with DBMS and MP, the password is DBMS and MP, as long as I know where the database is, 52% of the time during our assessments we're able to find a default password. That's significant that account can read a significant amount of data within the database. Um, CTX Sys, the last one there, that actually has, some, in different versions, has DBA privileges. So 30% of the time, someone can just connect to the database. These are all well published out. Anyone who's trying to hack into an Oracle database will first try some of these passwords. So a lot of organizations say, oh, default passwords aren't a problem. This chart really shows you that, yes, it is a problem, and this does exist in a lot of different databases. And unless you're actively looking for it, you've got this vulnerability that someone can pretty quickly get into a database and grab a lot of sensitive data or actually have read and write 
two sensitive tables. So you can actually just update bank account numbers and things like that. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Um, so can you talk to next on this next slide how to check database passwords? Yeah, so now that we and as we go through this presentation, we're kind of going to give you a little bit of an overview of the issue, talk about some details about it, and then actually tell you how you need to check it. So if you're actually doing an IT audit and work with your business suite environment, what are some of the things you need to walk through and look at? And some of these are easy things to do, and some of them are actually fairly complicated. So for like database passwords, there's three basic ways you can do it. Oracle, depending on the database version, gives you a default view. You can actually just query a table and it'll actually check out what some of the accounts are and the default passwords. And this is most often the way the DBAs do it, um, if they're doing it at all. I'd probably say about only about 25% of the time that we run into a client that DBAs have actually done this. So there's actually a way to do it. And with the DBA users with default passwords view, you actually get a fairly quick way to check some of the default passwords if it's a problem. The problem is Oracle's delivered method is pretty limited. It only checks one password for each account. The accounts have to be known by Oracle. The second method is actually there are a number of command line tools. So if you actually go on the internet, just do Google and type in brute force Oracle password, actually a number of different tools will pop up. Unfortunately, all these are command line tools, so they're pretty difficult to run. Um, if you're pretty savvy at running things on the command line, you'll be able to do it, but they, these are not GUI, easy to run tools. Um, and then the final option is um, there's a product called AppSentry for Oakley Business Suite, which Integrity sells, and we actually do a fairly robust checking of passwords. And we think we do what we, is right. What you should be doing is you check every single database password. You're checking it against massive password lists. So we, when we check the passwords, we check it against a million passwords. And then you can add in custom passwords. Uh, a very common one when we do audits in the Midwest, um, in towns that like hockey, Red Wings always pops up as a very popular password. Um, we check for things like that because you don't know what someone's going to be using. There's very standard passwords in the Oracle Business Suite like Welcome and Operations and Oracle. Um, but as you go by different areas, hey, people are going to try things like Red Wings. So that's basically the ways you can check the passwords. It's not very, very simple out of the box. It's not just a single command from Oracle that you can run to get a very robust way of checking it. And that's one of the problems with auditing Oracle Business Suite is not a lot of these things are easy out of the box to check. Sounds good. Well, hey, Steve, just a suggestion for me. I think you need to add Broncos and TiVo to that list. Yeah. No, no, uh, uh, TiVo's not on. That's actually a really good one to add. Uh, we do have Broncos and most of the sports teams in there, but TiVo would be a new one to add. Yeah, yeah excellent. All right. Well, um, next topic, uh, seated application accounts. So what we're talking about there is the seated uh, default application user accounts, so those that you use to log into the application. There is uh, about 40 of them that are known. Um, we continue to run and find um, new uh, accounts, uh, even in the releases of R12, as does the integrity on this topic. So uh, most of those have uh, seated default passwords. Uh, many of them are active, and some of them have pretty significant account privileges, like access to application developer responsibility or system administrator or a variety of other ones. Um, so some examples here are of active application accounts that we run across, um, MOB, ADM, mobile admin, wizard, um, all these have a variety of different uh, access privileges. What we recommend um, as we go through uh, an analysis and do our, do our application security assessment is to, to evaluate these to remove or end date as many as possible um, to the extent that there are um, uh, sensitive data or, or sensitive accounts that, that need to remain active, like sysadmin as an example, S-Y-S, A-D-M-I-N. Um, monitoring of that, we've got um, a, a portion of our book, or my book that I wrote, um, available uh, on use and care of generic logins that's actually available uh, at our website, ERPRA.net, so you can pull that down if you want to have more information on that. So the basics of this, again, um, I'll go through, uh, make a couple comments, then let Steve make a couple comments. Um, this decrypting passwords, um, logging into each account in App Sentry. So, Steve, I'll let you make a couple comment, comments on this as well. Yeah, kind of, there's three basic ways to do it, and decrypting all the passwords. Um, we'll talk about that later in this presentation. There is a way to actually decrypt all the Oracle applications' passwords. Um, that's well published out on the internet, and we'll get some references for that. Um, what's kind of funny is method two is that actually the way Integrity used to do it when we did our security assessments. We actually just log, attempted to log into each account. And, and back then there was probably 25 accounts, now there's about 40. And one of the reasons we wrote AppSentry was 
we couldn't do these things manually anymore. So we actually had to come up with a tool to allow us to do it. So again, it's a little bit more sophisticated way because then we check all the seeded accounts for even weak passwords. So whenever we check an account password, we're actually only not only checking what we think the default is, but against every other default and against a dictionary. Um, and then we're also checking that they're locked. So not only should these accounts be have their password changed, they should also be locked so no one can access them just in case the password gets reset or something. And we've actually seen that happen. It's not as common in the newer version of Oracle Business Suite, which is release 12. But in 11i, a lot of funny things used to happen. Things used to get reset all the time. And you'd go in and the DBA swore up and down that it got fixed. And then you'd go back in and say, oh, the patch got applied. And it actually reset that password or it changed some permissions that they had changed. Um, so one of the problems here is you always have to be going back and checking. And this is one example of this, some of the seeded passwords. Sometimes do get reset over time because you apply a patch and the patch just re-adds the account and it ends up, if it's already there, just resetting the password. Excellent. Well, we're going to move on to number three, uh, direct database access. Um, this is something we both run into on, on, on multiple occasions, but um, one of the higher levels of vulnerability and, and threat to the organization without a doubt. Um, so direct database access is, is a common, obviously, not only in production environment, but non-production environments. And uh, we see things like an apps read or an apps read only or something along those lines have very significant privileges. Um, and that becomes an issue uh, in terms of um, uh, sensitive data in particular. So usually most organizations have good control over apps, the apps account in the production environment, but um, fail to properly address some of the, the other issues. So I think this is fairly um, uh, common sense for most organizations. Um, you, you know, you need to be using individual database logins. Um, we often find from a policies and procedures perspective that that's, that is the policy in an organization, but um, often what we find is the uh, the policy doesn't match the reality um, and or, you know, the, the policy may say we prohibit the use of a generic login, but yes, that, yet most organizations haven't secured uh, the generic login, whether it's an update access or um, inquiry only. So you can see that from Steve's uh, prior slide that we showed a couple of slides ago. So what should happen is the, the data, database privileges should be specific to a person's role, um, role-based access control, if you will. Uh, to, to restrict privileges to the to the account. So if you have somebody supporting the applications on a financial side, they don't have access to the HR system. Um, Steve's talking about uh, password encryption or decryption risks. Um, that's another whole topic that we could talk about, but the access to the F&D tables have to be restricted in some cases as well. So Steve, if you could pick up here how to review direct database access uh, database accounts. Yeah, one of the fundamental issues about reviewing the direct database access is you kind of now have to be a database security expert to understand some of the things that are happening and some of the privileges that are actually assigned out. And then the second problem is that it's very difficult in Oracle, Oracle database period to say, okay, here's 5,000 tables somebody needs access to and they should only access those, but they shouldn't access these one or two tables uh, within the database. That's a very manual process and there's no simple way to do that with an Oracle database. So a lot of DBAs don't. And so what happens is you get too much access. Um, there is a great tool within the Oracle database called Fine Grain Access Control. Unfortunately, it takes a lot to set up, but it's very powerful because then you can pick off a single column like Social Security number and say, well, you can you have to access all the people because every the way the model data model works is you need access to a specific table, but you don't want to have to grant out Social Security number. Um, unfortunately, most organizations don't do that. They just kind of have an apps read account or they open it wide open, say, well, you can access every table. And that's an easy way of data theft if someone just wants to access the data. So really, just you have to go through manually and review the privileges. And there's no standard way to do it. There's no kind of methodology out there. What's the best way to approach a database and look at these privileges? You just basically have to start doing queries, bring up the data, say who has, who has access. And then when there's generic accounts like a apps read account that's a very common name to have you just the DBA will say well people need access I can't create individual accounts it's too much work I'll create an apps read account that has access to all the data well now that gets shared out the password might be apps read and unless you have auditing turned on you have actually no idea who's actually accessing that account um, so it does take a little bit of effort to go through and review the database privileges and the only way to do it is do it manually 
Yeah, and as we showed in the prior slides, um, there's a lot of vulnerabilities with this, so this is not something um, that uh, needs to be taken lightly, and it's obviously a very difficult process to, uh, to uh, evaluate and audit. And as we're going to talk about a couple of slides, and you've already alluded to, Steve, the, uh, the challenge is that, that once you think you've secured these, that they're new, they don't remain secured forever, or, or there's patches that add additional uh, uh, accounts. So this next one I'm also going to let you cover as well, Steve, the external access configuration. Um, go ahead and, uh, and and talk about this slide in the next this next whole topic. Yeah. So basically, one of the things that most Oracle Business Suite environments are now starting to do is deploy out to the internet. And the reason you want to deploy to the internet is there's some functionality within the eBusiness Suite that you want to expose. And the, one of the more common ones is a module called iSupplier. So iSupplier is meant for your suppliers to access information like purchase orders and entering invoices, um, and there's about 20 different modules. Another example is iRecruitment. And the way Oracle Business Suite works, this is kind of an inherent fundamental security weakness problem, but when you install the Oracle Business Suite, you install the entire suite of applications. So even though you might be running just financials or just financials in HR, you're actually also running customer relationship management, CRM, manufacturing. Oracle student system, the same thing that a university would be running, but you're not you're not a university, but you're still actually running that code because the application is so integrated, it installs everything at once, no matter what. There's no way to say, look, I'm not running manufacturing, don't install it. It always installs. So when you actually put up a web server and put it out on the internet, you've got like 20,000 different web pages that are accessible. And that's a massive footprint on the internet. So even though you might be just wanting to expose iSupplier, you're actually exposing every module you have. And there's a very specific configuration to fix that and kind of lock it down, but that has to be done. The second major issue is when you're connecting via the internet to the application server, the application server then connects back to the database. So you're running iSupplier, but the database account it's connecting at is a single database account that owns all the data. So even if you're running iSupplier, that should be just accessing financial data. If there's any problems on, in iSupplier, well, that account externally from the internet, I can be in Czechoslovakia accessing your iSupplier and breaking in, I can still access all your HR data. Um, so that's kind of a very powerful risk in the environment. So you've got everything installed, so you've got way too much installed, and you've got a very powerful database account trying to access the application. So if I'm trying to steal data, you've exposed your entire HR system to the internet and you have to be very specific on how you lock it down. So the first part of locking it down is that Oracle only certifies certain modules. So Oracle is made up of about 250 modules and so they've gone through and picked off what they think should be the ones that are exposed to the internet and they've actually done some additional security testing, um, done some additional configuration around these to hopefully secure them. So the most popular one is iSupplier. We see that all the time, iRecruitment. But there's another, a number of other modules, um, like iSupport is pretty common. Some of the other modules to the right hand are not <clears throat> very common at all. Um, but more and more organizations are deploying to the internet and you've basically opened yourself up to your entire environment if you deploy any of these modules are now on the internet. So what Oracle has done is now on the next slide, is come up with a very specific configuration. But the, which is very positive, but the problem is it's very specific. It's not done by default at all. So there's a number of steps that actually have to be done um, that go through, and there's two parts. One is you're trying to limit the access externally. So you use 250 modules, so one of the specific configuration items is go through those 250 modules and may, by name turn them on and off what should be accessible and not accessible. Um, and it's kind of fairly error prone because it's even the next step beyond that is you're actually picking web pages that should be allowed and not allowed. Um, and it's kind of an error prone. We actually see a lot of errors when people say, that, oh yeah, we configured it, we blocked off everything except the supplier, and you kind of go through and say, well, you got about half of it. You didn't really get it correct uh, because they're called rewrite rules. So anyone who's ever done regular expressions, basically you just got a file of about 300 regular expressions and you're going through and picking them one by one, uh, which is very, it's a time consuming error prone process. 
Right, and just uh, just as another comment, I see we have a joint client that we worked on together that also has deployed uh, self-service HR, manager HR, self-service HR uh, uh, externally facing as well. So that's uh, it's certainly one that has um, a lot of vulnerabilities as, as well. Do you have any comments on that one? Um, yeah, it's based on the module of how much risk, um, and newer modules tend to be a little bit better than older modules, um, but they all seem to... There's a fundamental foundation here that has to be done correctly, and then you kind of go through each module and try to clean it up as much as possible. And some of the modules are a little more complicated than other ones. So basically, if you do have an external configuration, you really now need to spend some additional effort to go through and make sure it's cleaned up, it's secure, um, that they've done it right. And the first part is a web architecture. So now you've deployed in your DMZ, and the DMZ requires a lot of different moving parts. And so a lot of organizations will actually do a very specific um, external web application security assessment, um, sometimes a penetration test to go through and make sure that everything's cleaned up. But you've got basically SSL, so now you're encrypting, so you're making sure if any credit card numbers or social security numbers cross the internet are encrypted. Um, hopefully your firewall is locked down, so you're only allowing the right ports. A reverse proxy server is actually used to protect the application server a little bit. Um, a web application firewall will stop common web vulnerabilities, um, like SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, Oracle releases every quarter has a couple of these types of vulnerabilities. Um, one of the things you can do is to help, help alleviate some of those issues is deploying a web application firewall. Integrity actually wrote one for specific to Oracle Business Suite called App Defend. Um, the next step is then to actually review the URL firewall configuration. So that's a list of rules, what's allowed and not allowed. And then there's about eight major configuration steps. So basically then you have to go through the application, say, okay, what responsibilities are allowed? Is the application server properly deemed to be an external application server? There's about eight different steps that you have to go through. Um, AppCentury will actually automate some of that checking for you. We can do six out of the eight checks um, in an automated fashion. Um, but still, again, some are a manual review and actually what responsibilities can be allowed externally. Because one of the other issues when you deploy externally, if you open it up just without doing all this configuration, you're basically just running on the internet. So any internal employee could just go home and actually connect to the application over the internet without going through a VPN and having proper authorization. So do you really want to have your system administrator logging in as sysadmin responsibility in the application across the internet? Uh, probably not. You probably want them going through a VPN and having a more secure connection. And those are some of the other configuration steps that are required. So it's kind of a, this gets into a very nitpicky type of configuration, but it has to be that way. The application has been around a long time and was never really designed to be on the internet. And there's a little bit of kludge in the way Oracle does it. All right, sounds good. Well, that was great. Uh, number six, we're going to go to number seven, um, forms that allow SQL statements. And uh, the gist of this, the risk and vulnerability, is that there are certain, or certain forms within the application that allow an ad hoc statement to be entered and executed within them. There's about 30, 30 plus forms um, that we've jointly identified. We continue to, uh, both Integrity and ERP Risk Advisors, identify um, new forms that get introduced by Oracle. Uh, we hope we've caught them all, but frankly, there's no manual that Oracle releases on these. It's a lot of them is hunting and pecking and, and running across them. So the, uh, the, the, the major concern from, from my perspective is uh, using those things to update high-risk data, such as bank accounts or supplier addresses, to be able to commit fraud and do that um, as if it, it looks like somebody else is doing the, the updates and, and such to the data. Um, so one of the things that we recommend, highly recommend, is deploying some type of monitoring mechanism. We like the use of checkers to be able to do it, um, to create a before and after value, uh, which is pretty effective and not 100% um, foolproof, but uh, it can provide a lot of um, uh, monitoring capabilities. So examples on this, the two ones that we see that most often are easiest to use, the alerts form, um, which is deployed widely in organizations. A lot of people define uh, custom alerts to be able to monitor certain activity. Um, so this is a form that a, a application developer or security administrator or somebody has in a, in a production environment and they can um, use that form when they're deploying something both for you know valid business purposes as well as for things like committing fraud or, or uh, accessing uh, certain data. So it's not like you can just shut down that form altogether and say well nobody's got an access to it. It has to be there for valid pur business purposes and to, to migrate things from a change management perspective. 
Um, so it, it, in some cases, you need to put some monitoring in place to, to, net, to net monitor what's going on. Um, collection plans is another one of those uh, within the quality module. Steve mentioned that you know all applications are deployed with your environment. You, you may think, well, we're not using the quality module, um, but the, the collection plan form is out there and accessible. And you know some of these things can be controlled, like I said, through access you know, proper access controls in the front end at the application level. But um, there are people that have access to these for for, for valid reasons. So here's a here is a listing of a variety of the forms that um, that are have been identified. Uh, we actually maintain a list within uh, what we call the internal controls repository, which is the Yahoo-based group that we've managed for five or six years now. So as, as we identify uh, new forms and functions that need to be monitored, new tables, um, we'll publish that in the internal controls repository for people to look at. The ICR is a, is a, is a Yahoo group I mentioned that's restricted to users only, end users. Um, we, we closely monitor and we kind of share some of the most valuable you know, intellectual property that we have with end users through that forum. So um, one thing I would recommend, we've done a webinar on this in the last couple of years. We want to see more detail. Um, act, uh, I forget, SQL forms, access and risk controls or webinar, and that's available through our website, through the recorded webinars link. Uh, if you want to get more detail on that and see some case study or some examples. Um, so from an access control perspective, uh, doing a sensitive function review is, is one of those things you want to make sure that only those uh, employees that are allowed to have access to these in a production environment that have been trained from a change management perspective that understand the process and, and procedures related to change management um, have access to these forms. So that's what we call a sensitive function review. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, it's very difficult to do without a, a quote unquote SOD tool, um, something uh, that would analyze and be able to do a function uh, level access because of the recursive nature, because of the method nature of menus. Um, it's one of the first things we look at from a security perspective when we get access to some of these tools. There are um, tools in the marketplace that are both embedded within the application as well as uh, software as a service type tools that we've used. And we could certainly do a sensitive function review if that's something you're interested in. So another way, maybe looking um, a less thorough way, but um, one of the things we'd recommend is looking for some high risk seated responsibilities such as application developer, alert manager, quality, uh, those type of things that have um, system administrators is, is another obvious one. So I would recommend, uh, if you want more detail on this, to uh, look at that recorded webinar that we've got uh, that was put out there a couple years ago. Any comments on SQL Forms, Steve, before we move on to the next topic? All right. Have you got it? Okay, sounds good. Um, then number 10, weak application password controls. Um, password profile options, there's a variety of those out there. Uh, password expiration time is set at the individual account level when you set up a user account. We like to see um, in the user's form the password uh, expiration date defaulted so that a uh, security administrator, when they go to set up a new account, um, that, that, is, uh, that automatically defaults to match your password because you know people that are doing security administration are human, they make mistakes, they leave, leave things out. Um, so there's a simple uh, personalization that we've done in that form uh, that's actually uh, one of the documents in the internal controls repository to set that up. Um, and there's a, uh, a simple monitoring SQL script in there as well that you can run to see if you've got uh, compliance with your corporate uh, password uh, policy on that as well. Um, so operationally, password operational procedures, initial passwords, uh, password resets. You know, password resets is a great example. What procedures do you have to validate if, if you're a help desk and you're and you're getting password uh, password requests resets to validate the identity of that person? Um, so it'd be easy to call up, uh, you know, a 1-800 number if you've got a centralized database. Say, hey, I'm John Doe. Uh, can you reset my password? What process do you have to communicate that reset password to them? Um, are you using you know standard password resets? Are you using welcome one? Uh, when you reset passwords or using some type of random process to be able to generate uh, password resets so people can't just uh, call and identify and then and then hack an account. Um, uh, so there's some features definitely in our 12 user management on this and then the next topic I'm going to uh, let Steve talk about is secure password storage. Um, that's uh, on a slide or two actually before we get to that topic. So. Sorry about that. Uh, a lot of decryption of account passwords um, and, and those that are not enabled by default. So we're going to talk about some password decryption, decryption risks. I think this slide after next. So we've got here some of the more common profile options that have to be set. 
uh, for EBS password policies. Uh, for, and, and for the most part, um, unless your your password policy is is pretty exotic, these uh, these passwords will be sufficient. Um, there is a way to customize this as well, but most organizations don't have to do that. So we will note that you know the default values 99% um, of the time have to be changed to, to meet your password organization policies, and this is fairly easy to to evaluate where these uh, uh, profile options are set. So I'm going to let Steve talk about this next slide, which is a topic they've been on the front of the cutting edge of for several years, which is password uh, decryption risk. So. Fundamentally, the issue is Oracle is not storing the passwords very securely by default within the application. Um, and where this becomes a risk is that very often in Oracle Business Suite environment, you've got a production environment. And often what you do is you copy that production environment down to test and development, and they refresh that occasionally. Um, so maybe every week for a support environment, then maybe the developer environment gets refreshed every quarter. What they're doing during that is just copying the production database down to the QA database and the development database. It's a very standard procedure and that's the way it works. One of the things that they're doing when they're doing that is they're actually copying all the production passwords also. So all the application passwords are copied down from production down to let's say development. And then they open up your development environment to maybe your offshore development team that's in India. Well what happens now is all the account passwords are there in development. And there's actually a method by default, as the way they're stored is they're in stored encrypted. And so with a little bit of knowledge, you just do a Google search on the internet and actually all the code is fully published out there. Someone can actually go in very easily and actually decrypt all those passwords. And remember, these are production passwords. I've got a developer in India now able to decrypt all my production eBusiness Suite passwords. So now they can have the AP manager's account now they can have the system administrator's password and just go sign on to the application as those people. And so Oracle, even in release 12, which is the most re recent release, is still in just encrypting the password unless the DBAs are optionally enabling a feature to actually hash them, which is a much more secure method for storing passwords. And so basically you've got that risk in most environments. We find in about 80% of the environments, very few environments are going through and optionally enabling this. Oracle's not really not recommending it very strongly. They say, well, yeah, if you want more security, you should do this. To us, it's not a more security issue. It's a mandatory type change because it's just they're doing it wrong and there's a lot of risk of people going in and grabbing passwords, especially when you can do it in a development environment and then go into the production environment and have full access to the application. You've now circumvented every single application control you have. Um, so this is a significant issue um, that a lot of people need to address and kind of a, just a, um, enable it. Um, and it is a little bit of a risk if when you enable it, you're making a change to the way the application works. Um, we find very few problems with it, but you do have to do pretty much a backup before you do it. And it's a change from the DBAs that need to be done during a maintenance window. All right, excellent. And this is your next slide, Steve. Um, yeah, so basically now if you need to check the uh, password controls within the environment, you can again do a manual review, um, do a number of queries, go through the application, pull back the system profile options. Um, one of the issues on the way the password controls work is there's a couple password controls which are system profile options. So those are basically settings for the entire application. So when you do password length, that's set for every user. But the password lifespan is actually set per user. So you actually have to go through and check every single user account and as Jeff talked about, there's a personalization, which is basically some customization to the application to force and force it to be set to something like 90 days. Um, otherwise, you have to actually go through and check every single user to make sure that the system administrator, when they created the account, actually set it to 90 days. Um, and we actually find a lot of problems that well, somebody else set it up, and the normal person was gone on vacation, and the new person didn't, wasn't quite sure and didn't set it. Um, so you can get a lot of problems when you're not meeting your password controls. And if the auditors come in and you do external auditors and you do a SOX review, sometimes that's actually picked up that, oh, by the way, you've got a dozen accounts that didn't have the password lifespan set. Um, the second issue is checking the encryption patch to make sure the FND user table is properly hashed passwords, not encrypted passwords. And then a manual review that also needs to be done about how you do account creation and password reset. Um, we find a lot of times when people are creating 
accounts within Oracle Business Suite, they're assigning the default password to Welcome One, and they just call up the person or send them an email. Oh, by the way, you can sign on now. Here's your user ID, and your password is Welcome One. In our reviews of different applications, we find about 20% of the application users set up never sign into the application. And that's actually pretty common. That's a pretty standard number because we see it somewhere between 5 and 50%. And 50% is when they set up all employees and the employees are able to log in and check benefits and things like that. But typically, even for a fully functional financial system, we're seeing about 20% of the users are never signed in. So if you're just assigning out the password welcome one, that sits there until the user actually signs in. And those accounts won't be terminated automatically. There's no method within the Oracle Business Suite to actually terminate a stale account. You have to do, actually do that manually. So there's lots of different issues around the way that, way that workflow process works. Again, AppSentry can help you automate some of this. We can actually go check all the system profile options against your specific password policy. We're not checking it against this uh, nebulous standard. We, we don't say seven. We want to actually check it. If your organization standard is eight within AppSentry, you configure it as an eight, and then actually we'll check it against that. And we can also check that the encryption patch is enabled correctly. Excellent. Sounds good. So talk a little bit more about AppCentric. It's, uh, it's always, it sounds like there's quite a few solutions, Steve, that can be solved using AppCentry. Yeah, we won't go deep in AppCentry, but we've kind of talked about it. I just wanted to give you a brief overview. One of the things AppCentry does is it tries to make it easy for you to actually audit the Oracle Business Suite. Um, and one of the complexities is that you're looking at a database, you're looking at an application, application servers. So one of the things AppCentry does is brings all that together versus having separate tools it's all in one tool that's very specific to the Oracle Business Suite. <clears throat> and trying to make it as simple as possible, so one of our design goals was actually to have an internal auditor was our main use case for users. Um, so as you can see, it's very graphical, very easy to click through. And the other thing that we've done within AppCentry is actually try to provide as much description in the solution. So this is a, actually one example of the password failure limit. So the policy is against the four, it's not set, and we actually go through a detailed solution and actually provide you out step-by-step -step instructions. So when a problem is found, it's not, oh, this is a problem, it's, well, this is a problem and this is the best way to solve it. And we actually, then you can provide that information to the DBA or the system administrator so they can actually go fix the problem as rapidly as possible. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, I think we're going to try to wrap up here now with a couple conclusion slides, and then we'll get into Q&A. Hopefully, we'll have uh, 10 minutes or so at least to provide Q&A. Um, so please, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, anything we've covered at this point, please use the uh, chat box to be able to give us some questions. So my conclusions, um, first, the first comment is most of the vulnerabilities and risks are ongoing, uh, whereas most audit processes are point in time. So the whole concept of continuous controls monitoring, or CCM, um, how does an internal auditor ensure, or how does a, an IT compliance expert um, within the IT organization, how do they ensure that as changes happen, you know, there's a lot of different things that can happen, whether um, a, a user profile option overrides a system level profile option, somebody forgets to be able to set a, a profile option at the user level, a patch comes in um, and, and resets a password or, or, or adds another database account or, or uh, application, generic application count, um, how does, how do you provide effective monitoring when typically audits happen, you become one or one or two times a year or in some cases one uh, one time every other year um, and then therefore your application is vulnerable between audits. So um, obviously from a, from a hot button within, a hot topic within the audit community is, is providing um, ongoing monitoring via CCM tools um, rather than point in time. So we like the use of AppSentry, and, and perhaps from an um, audit recommendation perspective, the thing to do is be able to recommend a tool like AppSentry to be able to do CCM on an ongoing basis. And whereas coming in and auditing, trying to go through all these audits um, individually and have that being only a point in time, um, uh, you can suggest to management to be able to buy a tool, um, AppSentry or something similar, that does this ongoing monitoring, and then your your goal as an auditor then is just to monitor the CCM process and, and make sure that it's you know being done effectively and, and 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 mitigation risks are being mitigated on an ongoing basis. So those are some of my comments. Um, I'm going to let Steve make a few closing comments here as well. 
So one of the things that we see when we do our on-site security assessments is really security and compliance within the Oracle Business Suite as a team effort. Um, you need to have IT security, internal audit, all working together with the DBAs. It's a very complex application. There's a lot of moving parts and pieces. It's constantly changing. It's probably one of your key applications in the environment, so any changes to it if that may impact operationally or performance-wise are always viewed very critically. Um, so it really takes a lot of effort and coordination between DBA's IT security and internal audit to make sure it's a secure and compliant environment. Um, and it's just kind of a step-by-step. -step. This is more of a detailed type issue. It's not a high-level direction type. A lot of times it's just you have to get your hands dirty, go through the application, make sure that everything has been secured. And within the application, it's always constantly changing. It's a huge application. There's always patches being applied. There's new risks. Every quarter, Oracle is releasing security patches. Um, so there's always something new on the horizon. Um, so you always have to be diligent about doing at least periodic reviews, at least annually, if not quarterly, to make sure that database passwords. Well, every time you apply a major patch, it's introducing new database accounts, which then have default passwords. Um, so unless you're constantly looking for those and the DBAs are aware, they have so many challenges just to keep the thing up and running. The last thing they're looking at is, oh, this patch, what, what did it actually change? Did it create a new account? Um, so you always have to be aware that something's new in the application, something's changed. Um, every patch can introduce a new security flaw. Then there's really no silver bullet here. It's, it's just a lot of different pieces that have to come together. Um, as we've talked about through this presentation today, we've talked about password policies and procedures. How are people creating new accounts? It's just reviewing on a periodic basis. It's, there's a number of tools out in the market that can actually help you solve some of these problems. But all these have to come together. There's nothing that just says, well, App Century will solve the problem, or putting in some policies and procedures will, or the greatest tool from Oracle. No, unfortunately, it's just a lot of different pieces to make sure the entire application is secure. Um, and if you're running externally, you've got risks there. If you're running it internally and have a large environment, you've got risks there. If you've got a lot of temporary employees. Um, there's a lot of different risks and threats that are unique to your organization that have to be addressed uniquely also. So there's no single book out there, no white paper, uh, no tool that can actually solve every problem. It's just going through diligently and make sure with the different teams from the DBAs and the IT security internal audit that you're coming together and say, okay, here's what our risks are and here's how we have to address them. And for those organizations, I always ask for, okay, what's our starting point? What should we do first? Well, Oracle actually does have some best practices documents. Um, here's the support notes from Oracle. Um, for those of you not familiar with Oracle, there's a support website called My Oracle Support, which you can get a, a login from your DBAs that can actually have you access these documents or they can download them for you. We actually wrote Oracle's best practices for them um, back in 2005. Uh, we were, worked with Oracle and actually wrote these best practices. Um, then Oracle refined them and has maintained them ever since until 2007. They actually haven't made any changes. Um, so if you do need a starting point, you should ensure at least you're secured to the best practices for security with Oracle, um, which is always a good starting point if you're looking for, okay, we need to do something today. I, I don't really know where to start. Um, some of the items today we talked about should be some of the things you're looking at. The next step would be using the best practices. Absolutely, we could probably talk about that topic for quite a long time, and I would just re reemphasize what Steve said. You know, those documents are static. I mean, Oracle uh, somewhat shies away from providing best practices uh, guidance because they're they're afraid of the legal risk associated with it, and, and the fact they haven't updated some of these documents for several years um, kind of is an indication of that. So that's where we come in from a services perspective. If you're interested, uh, to be able uh, to help uh, fill in the gaps and, and refresh the the data, so to speak. So last couple, last slide before we get into Q&A, um, some references and resources. Uh, the Integrity website, uh, there's a lot of information available as well as the uh, EFP Risk Advisors website. Um, we host a couple of uh, groups, uh, Yahoo-based groups, the Oracle Sox group that we've had up since probably 2004, and in, in a, in which is a public open domain group, or public domain open group. The Internal Controls Repository is a group that's limited to end users where we share some uh, more critical content, a part of our like, intellectual property than that. Um, and then there's a couple LinkedIn groups we don't have uh, listed here. My book is available. Um, it's still very relevant. It was written back in 2009, but there's really nothing in the book that is not relevant um, uh, in, in, the, in the context of an R12 environment as well. Um, and then Steve mentioned uh, the Oracle Best Practices documents, the, uh, the Best Practices document, the DMT config document. Um, 
So with that in mind, here's our contact information. Or we'll leave this up, and uh, you will get copies of these slides. Those of you are attending the webinar today, and I will turn the call back over to Phil to uh, to see what kind of questions we have to address. Thanks, Jeff. We've got quite a few questions here, actually. Um, and I'll throw it out there. I don't know which one you guys would respond to. I'll leave it up to you. The, the first one, can encryption resolve part of the all read access? That's Steve, all why don't you take that one? Yeah, can encryption Yeah, so basically, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so within the Oracle Business Suite, the only effective encryption is on credit card numbers. So Oracle actually has a patch available to encrypt credit card numbers in the application, which would be effective against the all read account. For any other data within the application, there's really no way inherently to encrypt it. There are some third-party solutions that don't work very well. And Oracle has a product called Oracle TDE, but that's only at the disk level. So when it's written out to disk, it's encrypted, so someone steals a disk drive. But once they sign on the application, they can see the data unencrypted. So encryption within the application doesn't provide much benefit except for the one specific case where it's credit card numbers. And often when we do, one of the services we provide is we actually have some tools that scan the database for things like credit card numbers and social security numbers. And we more than often find that sensitive data is also in custom tables, which then wouldn't even be covered by um, the Oracle encryption capabilities that are inherent. Um, so typically encryption, yes, it would if you're designing your own application, but within the Oracle business suite, it doesn't provide much protection. Um, and the path to go down should be, rather than thinking about encryption, is fine-grained access controls, which is delivered with the database, but it has to be manually set up. And you can actually pick a table and say, well, there's social security numbers in that column. I need to allow access to that table because that's the way the data model works, but I can actually exclude access to that one column. And that's a custom solution, but it's actually highly effective. Right. Yeah, I'll make a couple comments on this. There are, there are some third-party solutions that, that uh, use uh, take advantage of the fine-grained access control that are fairly easy to implement. You can deploy them pretty significantly across the application tier. So we've had some experience and success and success with that. But as Steve mentioned, um, you know, there's there's multiple where places or, or avenues that you got to secure data. It's data at rest, data in the application, data in the database, um, data moving across the network. So. Um, unfortunately, Oracle has not done a good job at, uh, at, at encrypting the data, some of the most sensitive data within the application, like social security numbers or national identifiers, bank account information, um, unencrypted. And that, to me, you know, Steve talked about the credit cards um, earlier and, and how valuable that with PII data is in the market. Bank account information is equally valuable. Um, so. The uh, the approach to sensitive data, um, my experience, I think Steve would would agree, has most organizations don't have a comprehensive strategy from a policies, procedures, and then technology perspective to address sensitive data. Most organizations have spent so much time on uh, sarbanes oxy compliance, the U.S. organizations at least, that they've almost not addressed it at all unless uh, unless they have to be PCI compliant and they've been forced to address it. But PII data in general is very vulnerable um, in most organizations. So, guess we can go on to the next question, Phil. Yep, next question. What is the best way to see, quote, custom password settings, end quote? I'm told this Java binary and therefore not easily readable by mere internal auditor. Steve, you want to address that one? For the Oracle to the suite, application account, so that's someone signing on to the application itself. If you have system administrator responsibility, you can bring up the profile options, or basically it's, you have to directly query the database. Um, there's no, it would be nice if Oracle could just produce a nice, clean, quick report. Unfortunately, there's no report like that. You really just have to go into the application, either at the database level and do some queries, or have a sign on to the application to be able to see system profile options, or have a third party tool that would bring that data back. Gotcha. Okay. Phil, next question. Uh, change management as a risk was not mentioned. How are we assured all changes are appropriate? Start by having a policy and, pro and progress, and then what to look for. Uh, I'll take a shot at this one, Steve. You can, ch you can chime in with anything I missed. Um, we could spend uh, you know a four-hour training class on change management policies and procedures and monitoring. 
Um, the, we talked just, just highlighted patching as a risk, and then whenever patches are applied, you know, there's a significant amount of risk uh, that we have, you have to address both from an operational and a controls perspective. So I, I always break down um, change management into four uh, elements of risk. You have security, you've got patching, you have configuration changes, and you have development objects. And all of, all of those um, may follow the same high-level policy within an organization, but when you're talking about standards and then procedures related to those, um, they have very different paths. So the comment I would make is, you know, again, we could spend four hours probably on this topic alone. Um, Steve and I both have done a lot of consulting uh, on change management in general and specifics of what does that look like in a patching environment? What does that look like from a configuration change management is a whole other, you know, ball of wax. So um, we can certainly maybe set up a call offline and, and, and go through your specifics on this, but, you know, it's a, it's a much bigger topic. And I think we've got maybe time for uh, maybe one more uh, one or two more questions, Phil, so, so if we can uh, move on to the next one, it'd be good. Uh, there's a question. It says, which version of the database does this view, quote, DBA underscore users underscore with underscore DEFPWD, end quote, come into existence? Um, by default, that view is available in 11G and above, so 11.1 .1, 11 11.2. It's available as a patch for previous versions. So there is a specific patch that the DBAs can look up and uh, find and apply. I don't know patch numbers off the top of my head, but basically it is capable of being backported to the other versions. But in 11G, it should be there by default. Super. All right. Well, I'm going I'm to wrap up, Phil, if that's all right. We've got one more minute left, and we can certainly respond to some of these questions um, offline, and uh, maybe some of them we'll take, and we'll put it in an FAQ document related to this. Um, one of the uh, the goals at ERP Risk Advisors uh, in providing this um, this webinar was a answering the question: How do I insource my IT audit functions? And there's a lot of organizations that outsource this. Um, small to medium sized organizations will outsource this. Even some larger organizations. One of the things I think you'll identify through this is the complexity of the issues. And not only it's a point in time, but it's ongoing CCM. So. Um, I wrote an article um, a couple months ago that was published by OEUG, and, um, and it's uh, why ERP implementations fail beyond the obvious. And one of the things I talked about in there is that there is a significant amount of software beyond what Oracle provides that, need, that an organization needs to consider purchasing um, and or having um, a, a ability for somebody to come in and use on a license basis. And uh, w one of the things we felt strongly in is Integrity has, has been a leader in, in IT security, and we wanted to provide some information that was both helpful and informative, but to, to give you guys an opportunity to see how um, there's software out there in the marketplace that would really allow you to, as an auditor, uh, as an IT auditor in particular, to be able to insource um, some of the major monitoring. And in some cases, if you're an IT manager or security manager, um, it would give you the ability to monitor uh, a lot of these vulnerabilities, most of these vulnerabilities we talked about today. Um, so I would just encourage you guys, if you're interested in finding more information out, um, contact myself or Phil or Steve. Um, we certainly can work with you on providing some more information about um, AppCentury as one of those solutions. And